guys, it's your host, Eureka. And today I'm so excited to have with me Shauna Shapiro. And Shauna is um, a mindfulness teacher and self-compassion. I read so many of her books and I'm just super, super honored to have her on this show today. Um, so did you want to say anything? <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. And yeah, I've, I'm a professor and a scientist and a mother and I've spent the past 25 years studying mindfulness and self-compassion and really exploring how it can impact our physical health and also our psychological well-being. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for sharing. Because this um, this series is on self-love, I was, you know, and I know you because I read a lot of your books and listened to a lot of your videos, but I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your story and your struggle with, with self-love. Yeah, so... Um, I was introduced to mindfulness when I was a teenager. I actually, um, I had spinal fusion surgery. So when I was 17 years old, I went from this very active, healthy teenager to lying in a hospital bed, unable to walk. And it was really during that surgery and during the many months of rehabilitation in a hospital bed that I discovered mindfulness because I really just didn't have the tools to cope. And mindfulness kind of gave me this path forward and this possibility that I could be happy again. And so as I began to heal, I ended up going to Thailand and Nepal and learning more about mindfulness in the monasteries and, and practicing meditation. And when I came back, I started studying the science of mindfulness, really how does it help for women with breast cancer or worked with um, mothers and parents and college students and high level CEOs. and worked with a lot of different people from very different walks of life. And what was interesting is that everyone kept talking about the same thing, this tremendous self-judgment, um, deep lack of self-love. And I knew exactly what they were talking about because I felt that too, this, this kind of constant sense of I'm not good enough, I'm not doing it right. And I realized that mindfulness, um, had a lot to do with kindness. It wasn't just about paying attention, which is what people often think of mindfulness and be present. It's about paying attention with kindness. And so I started studying shame and judgment and what it does to our brain. And I also started studying kindness. And what I discovered was that when we judge ourselves, when we shame ourselves, it shuts down the learning centers of the brain. It actually inhibits the brain from learning and thus from changing. And so if we make a mistake or if there's something in our life that we wanna change, beating ourselves up doesn't work. The most effective and powerful way to do it is through kindness, through being compassionate, through saying, oh, sweetheart, you know, this is hard, instead of shaming ourselves. And so that, that really kind of started my journey into this exploration of self-love and really the science behind it. Because when you talk to someone about loving yourself or being kind to yourself, they kind of roll their eyes, you know, they're kind of like that, that's so new agey. And that's why I believe the science is so important. Yeah. Thanks for explaining and sharing that. So, um, you touched on a part about like something that a lot of people struggle with the, the self judgment, right. And constantly beating ourselves up and we can combat that with self compassion and kindness, as you said, um, what, is some like a practice or something that they can people can um, start to incorporate in order to you know quiet that the judgment and so there's a couple things the first thing is just to notice the judgment to become aware of it and and not to believe it right so often we believe our thoughts they're not true and so the first step is just to kind of say thank you for your opinion but not necessarily believe it the other practice that I think is really important is to actually actively cultivate self-kindness. So one is to become aware of the judgment, but the other is to grow your, your care for yourself. And I discovered this practice when I was going through a very difficult time in my life. Um, I was getting divorced and it was very painful. We had a three-year-old child who we both loved and it was a very hard time. And I remember waking up every morning with this kind of pit in my stomach, like, 
I've messed up my own life. I've messed up my son's life. And my meditation teacher suggested I start practicing more compassion, more kindness. And she said, I want you to say, I love you, Shauna, every day when you wake up. And I was like, no way. <laughs> you know, it just felt so contrived and so inauthentic. Yeah. And so she saw my hesitation. She said, how about just saying good morning, Shauna? And she said, try putting your hand on your heart when you say it. It releases oxytocin. It's, it's good for you. <laughs> she knew the science would win me over. So the next morning I woke up, I put my hand on my heart, took a breath, and I said, good morning, Shauna. And it was kind of nice, right? Instead of the judgment and the shame, there was this flash of kindness. Mm -hmm. And I kept practicing and I practiced for a few weeks. And then I remember one morning, it was my birthday and I was completely alone. It was the first time I didn't have my husband or my son with me. And I woke up and I put my hand on my heart to do my good morning practice. And this image of my grandmother came to my mind. And before I knew it, I said, good morning. I love you, Shauna. Happy birthday. And it was as if the dam around my heart broke and I could feel my grandmother's love and my mother's love and my own self-love. And, you know, I wish I could say that every day since then has been this miracle of self-love and I never feel judgment again. And that's not true. But what is true is this pathway of kindness was established and it continues to grow. What we've learned is whatever you practice grows stronger, right? That's the foundational teaching of neuroplasticity. And so our repeated thoughts and emotions shape our brain. And so we want to be mindful. We want to choose what we practice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that was so beautiful, the, um, the pathway, the kind, the pathway of kindness. And just like, you know, as like one of our other speakers talk, Rick Hansen talked about is like really strengthening those neural pathways. And yes. Um, yeah, so thank you for emphasizing that. Again. And we have a choice, you know, Rick's work, mm -hmm. which I love, he's a dear friend. He focuses on positive neuroplasticity because neuroplasticity shows that, that we can change and shape our brain based on practice. But if you're practicing judgment and anger, you're growing pathways of judgment and anger. So neuroplasticity is not necessarily good, right? It's either, it can be negative or positive. And that's why I love Rick's work because he says, you can engage in practices that grow resources. For example, the good morning, I love you practice or a gratitude practice or even just smiling meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's why your, your book that you recently published, Good Morning, I Love You. Um, yeah, I, I read that book and um, I, I remember reading that, that story that you shared and I think that's a practice that we can all also incorporate if you're struggling with, you know, even liking or like loving, loving yourself. How about like liking yourself and just saying good morning? Um, right. Just, just begin. And that's what I tell people that wherever you are, that's the entry point, right? You know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect and you don't have to do it exactly. It's just 5% more kindness or 5% more compassion. Again, this isn't about perfection, it's about practice. And whatever you're practicing is growing stronger in every moment, not just when you're meditating or when you're thinking about it, but every moment throughout the day we're practicing. And so can we just kind of bring a little bit more self-kindness into our daily life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna to touch a little bit on um, affirmations and your opinion about them because my experience with some affirmations where sometimes they're just like so far out there kind of like how you were saying like I love you Shauna and you just have this gut reaction like oh my gosh that's so not true and then even though we practice that it all like sometimes it makes us feel a little bit like worse because it's so unbelievable it's and a great like, yeah, yeah it's a great question so after I typically don't do affirmations um, because I feel like they're a little far from reality um, however, I do think it's important to incline the mind towards the good. So for example, I might not be feeling happy, but I might do a smiling meditation practice mm -hmm. because when we smile, it sends a biochemical signal to our nervous system that we're safe. And so I might engage in this practice, not to force happiness, but to create an environment of safety and ease. And so when I say, good morning, I love you it's almost like I'm setting the compass of my heart in that direction. I'm saying, 
I want to cultivate greater love for myself. And maybe I only feel it 5%, maybe I feel it 100% some days, but for me, the importance is to keep planting those seeds. Um, so what are some other components of like a self-love practice that people can start to incorporate? Right. So, so in my book, Good Morning, I Love You, I really talk about both the science and the practice. And there's hundreds of different practices, but I tried to make some really clear, simple, kind of like a roadmap of how to develop this. And I think another way to develop um, self-love is really through practicing self-compassion. And self-compassion means when you're suffering, when you're having a difficult time, that you treat yourself as if you were your dear friend. So let's say your dear friend comes to you and says, I'm really scared. What would you say to her? How would you respond? Right? You would say, oh, sweetheart, you're scared. And you would kind of pat her on the back. But when you're scared, how do you treat yourself? And so the key is to kind of shift consciousness. So you imagine, how would I treat my son if he came to me feeling sad? And then treating yourself as you would a dear friend. So there's these three parts to self-compassion. And the first is mindfulness, which is just knowing your, your suffering. Most of us, when we're suffering, we, you know, we go have a drink or we turn on the TV or we open the refrigerator. So the first step is just naming it. And there's a wonderful study at UCLA called Name It to Tame It. When you name your emotions, you actually calm your physiology down and you actually tame them. So the first step is to name it mindfulness. The second step is kindness, bringing kindness, soothing yourself, caring for yourself, right? We forget to care for ourselves. And then the third step, which is so beautiful, is common humanity, which is recognizing you're not the only one who's in pain, that it's natural, right? All of us, all of us go through breakups, all of us get flat tires, all of us struggle. It's part of life. And so in a moment of pain, and this for me has come up a lot recently, let's say I'm feeling lonely or isolated, to think of all the other people who are feeling lonely, and then to send my compassion out to them as well as to myself. So I recognize I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, another component of that I feel people struggle with regarding to self-love is this lack of self-worth, right? Mm. And um, I think that that weighs very heavily heavily on many people's hearts. Um, Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's so sad, this this sense of I don't deserve to be happy or Mm. I'm not as valuable. And one of the most powerful um, experiences I had with that was when I was working at a veterans hospital and I was leading a group uh, for men with post-traumatic stress disorder. And there was one man in the group for two months. He never said a word. He never looked up. And finally, one day he raised his hand and he said, I don't want to get better, which I'd never heard a patient say before. And then he said, I don't deserve to get better. What I did in the war, what I saw in the war, I don't deserve to get better. And that was the most extreme case I've seen of the sense of unworthiness of, of I don't deserve. And what was so remarkable is he then told us what he had seen and, and worse, what he had done in the war, which was clearly wrong. But as he looked up and he looked around the room at the other men's faces, there was no judgment. There was only compassion. They were willing to see who he truly was not based on his past actions. They were really, really willing to kind of see his humanness. And you could feel how something in him began to thaw when, when he experienced that and how he began to develop his own self-compassion. And so I think there's a way in which we also heal each other, where we remind each other that we're worthy, that, um, that all of us, all of us deserve happiness. All of us deserve love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's a, what is one self-worthy practice that one can start to incorporate? 
Well, I think all of these practices really are about caring for yourself and, and people who care for themselves, take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite lines from the Buddha, he says, you can search the whole world and not find anyone more deserving of your love than yourself. And it doesn't mean you're more deserving or less deserving. It's just you're equal, that, that you matter just as every other human being does. And really recognizing that we're all connected, that you're not this separate person over here, that all of us are completely interdependent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, especially with what's going on right now, the, I really sense this like interconnectedness of the entire world. We're starting to become more aware of this interdependence and really to see it in a physical manifestation. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to touch a little bit on self-forgiveness too, because, well, you know, these are, it's, these things are all components of self-love and, um, the, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking like, and some people have reported to me or my clients who talk about, you know, some, like you were sharing, like something in the past that they just, they can't forgive themselves for yeah. and um, like how people struggle with that. Yeah. So in my book, I have a whole chapter on forgiveness because I think it's so important. And what I found is it's a practice. It's not like you all of a sudden are like, I forgive myself. <laughs> it's a practice of self-forgiveness. And how I typically practice forgiveness, first of all, is to help people understand it doesn't mean that you agree with or condone a behavior. So forgiveness is not, I agree with you. It's I'm not willing to poison my heart anymore with anger and resentment toward another person or toward myself. And so when you practice forgiveness, first is to recognize it's a direction. It's not a destination. You're pointing your heart in the direction of forgiveness, but it doesn't mean you have to get there immediately. The second thing is I like to do it as a three-part practice. So first, I think about someone else that I've hurt, someone that I may have harmed, and I ask their forgiveness, and I feel my own remorse and my own sorrow and I asked to be kind of forgiven for this transgression. The second step is I asked to forgive myself. I realized just as I've hurt others, I've also hurt myself and I asked for my own forgiveness. And then third is to offer forgiveness for someone who has hurt me because we recognize no one's perfect. All of us are doing the best we can. And that forgiveness is a beautiful, I believe, daily practice where every day you just a little bit more, a little bit more forgiveness, a little bit more tenderness. Yeah, thank you for that. That reminds me of, um, there's a meditation by Vishen Lakhiani that, you know, I practice called the six phase meditation and takes takes you through many different phases and forgiveness is, is one of them. So like you mm -hmm. said, it is a daily practice. And in, in my experience, um, even if it's like kind of like a, a, a larger event that had a lot of pain, Mm -hmm. Every day, it became a little bit less and less and less um, because yeah. I was doing this practice. And Whatever you practice grows stronger. So you can really grow these pathways of forgiveness, of self-love, of gratitude, of kindness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, you know, even the three things that we talked about, um, self-compassion and self-worth and, and forgiveness, even if you do one of those three things, like it tends to just like bleed out in, in the other areas, right? If we're self-compassionate, then we just are by default are going to be practicing self-forgiveness and self-kindness. They're and, all connected. Yeah. And They're talk about interconnected, <laughs> like all of those things are connected as well. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Yeah. So um, in your opinion, what, what do you think that people struggle with the most regarding self-compassion? A couple things. I think a lot of people are afraid that if they're compassionate with themselves, they'll stay stuck, that they'll keep repeating bad patterns. So for example, someone who's trying to lose weight, they feel like if they're kind to themselves, then they won't exercise or stick to their diet. But what the research shows is the opposite is true, that the kinder, more compassionate people 
are better able to stick to their diet and exercise. They're better able to quit smoking or quit drinking. And so I think a lot of times people are afraid that if they're kind to themselves, it'll be self-indulgent or selfish, but we find the opposite is true. So I think that's one really important thing. This, the other thing is that I think it's just so foreign. You know, I remember the first time I put my hand on my heart, I was like, whoa, that feels a little awkward or strange. Um, and then I remember like tears came because there was this sadness that I had never treated myself kindly. Like the, it felt so poignant to me. And so I think it's a very tender and courageous practice um, and it requires great gentleness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm really curious about that because there's a really fine line between, um, let's just use overeating, um, right, and having, let's say we're going to the fridge often and, and snacking a lot and we're gaining weight, um, and, and then, like you said, feeling stuck, saying it, they fear that, oh, if I say, oh, it, that's okay. They feel I, like it's I okay, really, right. Yeah, so like. So okay, here's I really the, need that. Yeah. But here's the situation. When you beat yourself up for overeating, what happens is you shut down the learning centers of the brain and you actually can't change. So you get yourself stuck in that cycle. When you bring self-compassion, then it gives you the courage to say, why am I going to the refrigerator again and snacking? And you can start to bring your mindfulness to unwind the pathways, the patterns, so that you can actually make a choice. Oh, sweetheart, you're just feeling lonely right now and you can redirect. Mm -hmm. So self-compassion actually gives you more choice and control than you would expect. Yeah, and definitely like as you were sharing that, I'm like, oh, mindfulness, because it takes one second to be like, oh, yeah, why am I going to the fridge or what am I feeling where I need to you know, consume, whether that's shopping or TV or food. And exactly. um, yeah, take, take a step back and then make, make a different choice. And I think that's really the key is, is behind the science. It's why I think I love the science so much is people are sometimes like, it's counterintuitive. Like it's counterintuitive that self-compassion would help you be more productive or help you lose weight. And yet what the science shows is it does. And I think that gives people permission to then try to practice themselves. And I think, you know, what I want to close with and what I think is most important is that people realize it's never too late to change. That no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what has happened to you, all of us have the capacity to rewire our brain in every single moment. And that for me is the most comforting thing that it's never too late. Yeah, thank you. So for everybody watching, if you haven't already read Shauna Shapiro's book, Good Morning, I Love You, definitely recommend it, as well as many of her other books. Um, I think I've also read The Science of Mindfulness and Self-Compassion, which uh, I really enjoyed as well. So mm -hmm. thank you again, Shauna, for your thank time. Thank you so really much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for doing this important work.